Okay, we're here with Agatha, and uh, it's quite late in London, 7.30ish, but thank you for joining me right now. My pleasure. Um, it, it is quite late. You're, as we said, you're getting the late night, Agatha, right. uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm extremely curious about your work and your life. I mean, I came across kind of what you were working on. I was like, oh, this is different. This is something I... I I would I feel like I would want to talk about for it. So nice. let's uh talk a little bit about your work in agritech and DEI advocacy, all this stuff. But let, let's go back. This is the way back machine. How did this even come to fruition in your life, the work you're doing? It's such an interesting question. And I do do keep on asking it myself, um, because I do have quite a weird background. And I'm one of those kids where I don't think I have an ADD and I don't think I have a problem with, with uh, the deficiency of, um, of, uh, um, of uh, how I focus. But I actually started realizing it as I grow into my uh, late 20s now that I've always been a kid that can't focus on just one thing. I did a degree in music um, back in Poland where I'm from. And I wanted to learn everything about uh, films. So then I devoted my life to, to learning everything about uh, films and filmography. Um, and then I went into multiple different areas of life and I realized that I can't be an expert on every single thing. But I wanted, you know, when I started learning English, that's what all I wanted to learn about. I, I didn't care about Polish maths. Then I went to the maths. Then I went into, you know, other topics and I realized that my life is going to be extremely difficult if I don't set my priorities straight, because I will be just going from one topic to another, not really being interested um, after a couple of years of really mastering it um, and uh, really just jumping from one point to another. And so I think in a personality like this is really good for people who don't want to be um, experts on, on just one topic. I want to know a little bit about everything. Um, and so uh, there are very few jobs where I feel you can actually be good at anything uh, if you know a little bit about everything. But I think tech is just that one area um, where you can swing by and you can make a living with knowing just enough to, to not call yourself an expert, but you can know just enough uh, about a few things uh, to educate others and uh, bring into different organizations. Um, and so I thought I want to be a politician. I started uh, studying that in Poland, um, but I quickly realized that Poland uh, is a small country in Eastern Central Europe and the mindset's quite not there. Um, See, so I, I mentioned that I learned e English. I mentioned that I loved movies. And unfortunately, what you see in the movies in the Western world don't really you know, replicate what's happening in Poland or what was happening in Poland 15, 20 years ago. And um, so what I started doing is I started planning out how to get out of Poland. And um, so I started studying marketing in Copenhagen and then I moved on to business. And that switch was really what started kind of um, making me who I am today. I found a, an element in business, which is innovation, entrepreneurship, venture building, investment, which is something that you don't have to be an expert on, on a single thing, but you can just go by knowing a little about different things. So that's how I got into alternative materials, because I just happened to work with a startup that was doing, you know, bio leather. Uh, that's how I got into agri-tech. Again, I was working with a startup doing the same thing. Um, and I suppose there are certain elements where you, that you have to know. Um, I've heard uh, from, from someone else previously that, you know, it's only about 25 to 30% of, of a single business idea that it, that is different from any other business in the world. Um, but there are always, you know, there is the 70% that's always the same. It's always the same way you do business. And um, even if it's disruptive, there's always going to be the email that you have to send and the sale that you have to close. So that's really how I got to 
do what I do. So I work as a program manager at uh, one of the biggest open innovation platforms in the world. Um, and by open innovation, I mean um, we link the most innovative startups to corporations, solving their challenges and market opportunities. Um, at the same time, we invest into startups. So that also helps when you can't really focus on one thing and just have your eyes really everywhere. It really helps uh, in that industry. Um, and at the same time, I'm super passionate, as you mentioned, about DNI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I'm passionate about making a diverse and inclusive space for everyone to be. Um, everyone in the room, I want them to feel like they have a voice, like they know what they want, they know that they can ask for things, they don't feel like they're there by accident. Um, I am myself an introvert and I know how difficult it is to be in the room and talk. And then imagine if that's multiplied by the fact that you're the only woman in the room, you know, uh, or, or you're the only person that doesn't look like everyone else, or you're the youngest person in the room. That's that fear that we have and I want to break it down. So that's who I am. I love it. We're going to get to that for sure. That part of it. Let me go into the tech space area. So mm -hmm. in your time and being in that space, what have you learned about being in that space that is really amazing, maybe surprising to you, and maybe the other side that maybe is a little disappointing to you? Um, the surprising thing about the tech is that there is really a, a solution to every single thing. I mean, whatever you can think about it right now, and uh, whatever you can think about right now, there's probably someone doing something that's similar to what you're thinking about. And I just love how, uh, at, on one hand, it's super democratic, right? If you have a good idea, no matter who you are, where you're coming from, what you look like, you, you people will buy into it because it's a good idea. You sell, solve someone else's problems and pain points. So I like that almost a perfect version of uh, what entrepreneurship and tech is. Um, and technology, I mean, I see technology as a way to solve the problem of climate change. I saw, I see technology as a way to make the world safer, a safer place. Um, and I really see technology as that answer uh, that, that can really give us, you know, the humanity that we deserve. Um, which unfortunately at the moment is kind of stalled through different um, different elements. Um, so I really like the fact that it's quite democratic and, and everyone can have access to it. You just need a phone um, or a computer. At the same time, unfortunately, there is the down, downside to, to tech, which means that since I said it, it's democratic, it's actually not democratic at the same time. Um, you need that phone to access any apps in the world, but you do need a phone. Um, the access to knowledge is very democratized. Anyone can, you know, go online and search about something, but there is the barrier of funding uh, of new tech development that actually means that only people with means, only people with education, education can develop the tech um, and get funding. Um, because whilst it's true that no matter who you are, you can actually sell the product, it's it's not true when you talk about uh, getting funding and knowing the right people. That's such a great barrier to technology at the moment is that there is there are fantastic ideas in the market, but they don't get the funding they deserve, mainly because of the barriers of the ENI and, and the and the um the kind of personal barriers that people experience. Um, so whilst I would love to say that tech enables, because it enables billions of people access healthcare, uh, financial services, insurance, it also means that only probably top 1% will get it first uh, and then will set it up for, for themselves and then kind of trickle down to, to the lower parts where, where people can't really afford a smartphone uh, and, uh, and you know, need to choose between what, what do I want? Do I want food or what, what do I want to buy crops 
or do I want to buy a smartphone that will enable me to further then grow my uh, uh, business? So how is that problem in your mind? How can we bridge the gap on that effectively so that it's not such a haves and have nots? Oh, I love this question. Um, it actually makes me, me think in, in different ways because I, I never kind of thought, you know, how can we actually bridge that mm -hmm. gap? Um, I think it might be a boring answer, but I think the governments are really key in here. Um, we all we all saw kind of the downfall of NGOs of you know the Western builds then move to uh, emerging markets, hoping that they kind of solve all the, all the issues. But well, that's um, in some cases, obviously, I want to give all the credit, but in some cases, it's just uh, wishful thinking. But I believe that the governments actually have fantastic way of implementing uh, uh, the democracy and access to funding and technology and education, uh, mainly because um, uh, there are governments like the UK government, for example, um, has multiple programs uh, running at the moment in Africa where they support entrepreneurs and they try to really get the, the talent from Africa to come to the UK, see how the business is built here, how the tech is built here, get some funding, really get the things going and then bring it back to uh, their respective countries and then really try to implement it back there obviously not every single thing will translate there are many business and cultural differences that mean we can't really look at it in a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio but i believe that the government funding is really the key um to to making sure that everyone has equal access but again we are looking at bias in the government we are looking at cor corruption mm -hmm. and and unfortunately this is not something that every government uh, could just take and run with um and we've seen it uh, with an example of uh, the uh, donations uh, of uh, the covid vaccine for example and um, so i wouldn't want to say that it would work in every single case um, and then there are organizations um that for example i'm working with uh, pen promise which is a venture build uh, company based out of uh, Northern Nigeria. Um, and there are two fantastic female founders, which I love so much. And basically we're trying to solve a problem of the fact that very often the emerging markets population is super entrepreneurial. You know, everyone has a gig going. No one really has like a nine to five job. It's more about what you produce, you sell, or what you 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 make, you sell. Um, so there is an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit that we would like to um, that we would like to see in in societies, even in the UK, for example. It's quite easy to get stuck in your job and not really do anything um, beyond that. So going back to to the point, Pen Promise is actually supporting uh, underrepresented founders in that educational part, where it's not only important to be entrepreneurial. That's the first step, but then you also need to know how to build your product, how to sell it, how to market it, how to price it, how to come up with a business model. And so the ladies at Pen Promise actually do do that. They help to educate the society on how to be entrepreneurial. Uh, but then they also help educate the society on how to build a product that will be able to scale and then sell better uh, so that they can make more money than just being entrepreneurial in their um, regular ways, for example. That's fantastic stuff. I mean, it makes me think about, well, one, when you started speaking about the government, I was like, I don't think this is the U.S. government we're talking about here. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> Honestly, I've... I, yeah, no. <laughs> well, like, this has to be a different government than the United States government. We're not doing any of this stuff <laughs> that I oh. see on a regular basis. <laughs> it's like, no. I'm like, these programs, what programs? I'm like, this is amazing. No programs. This no programs. I, if it is, I haven't seen it. I've been in America okay. my whole life. But I think these yeah. are pretty cool things going on. But there is a lot of corruption, things of that nature. But I, I am curious, though, like, what are the biggest problems that tech you feel like tech needs to solve for our world to move forward, for there to be 
a more equal playing field or opportunities for people piggybacking on that whole kind of conversation of democratizing things? What are the problems that tech can solve, you think, or will solve for this to happen? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love, love, love during this question. It's brilliant because they're like, I have my answer. Everyone else will have a different answer. Okay. So it really is that point of uh, argument where I, I love it because no one really is not correct. But in my opinion, tech is really here to solve a couple of main issues that I see are um, kind of a, a hindrance to, to the society at the moment. And one of them is corruption. Talked mm -hmm. about that. We all know, um, unfortunately, none of our respective governments are free from it. Um, and probably no one is because democracy, democracy is not really built... Um, uh, or, or without specific um, uh, uh, elements in place, the democracy is not really built for it. But um, it also really depends on the culture. It really depends on the history and independencies. So I'm not trying to say that there are countries that are better, countries that are worse, just because of their corruption level. But I think that I truly believe in blockchain as a mean to solve corruption um in especially in, in the government's area uh, and in countries that really would need that support of um democratized access to data uh, and shared data uh, in order uh, to to lower the levels of um uh, corruption so i do truly believe that once we start adopting blockchain into transactions and governments and the way they share the data, make decisions, et cetera, basically making everything transparent, um, that will really kind of make people think twice be before they, they try to um they try to try to do anything. So I yeah. do believe in, in blockchain. And then the second part is climate change. I mentioned that before. I'm really passionate about climate change, but I feel like I don't really know nearly enough to, to be an expert. However, I truly believe that the tech that we're producing today, and bear in mind, I work in the mobility platform with uh, some of the biggest um, OEMs and car producers in the world, like Jaguar Land Rover and Bentley. And over here, we really, the, the number one thing we're looking at is how to go net zero, yeah. how to produce a car using sustainable materials. You know, everyone's talking about alternative leather. Um, uh, everyone's talking about the cactus or leather or, or pineapple leather. Um, how can we utilize the car carbon that's in the air and compress it to make plastic parts uh, for your car? Wow. And so there are pretty I've never heard technologies. Of that. Jeez, I know, man. me neither. That's insane. It's, it's fantastic. I know, I know. It's it's really incredible. Um, so pretty soon, I believe that the tech will actually actively work, not only to go net zero, but also to sequester and get the carbon out of the air. Um, because there is a certain amount of carbon in the air right now that we're producing. And bear in mind, we'll never stop producing carbon. But it's carbon capturing technologies that I really am counting on. At the moment, unfortunately, it's it's still too expensive and it's still you know producing more carbon than it that it captures. But I do believe that you know some smart people in the labs will finally work it out and they will make sure that we can all you know, have the planet that we deserve. Um, and I think that those two things, you know, democracy, lack of corruption, uh, climate change, and the fact that we can all live a safe life. I mean, I'm in the UK, but I'm originally from Poland, and Poland is very close to Ukraine. Right. And I'm not sure how the information flows in, in the US, but we are all you know, still pretty shocked. We are uh, doing whatever we can to to support Ukraine. Um, and at the same time, no one can really do anything, yeah. uh, you know, meaningful. Um, so I, I wish that the tech could actually support us in, in being more transparent and, uh, and being more supportive to the causes that we actually care about. Man, I, this is like awesome stuff, seriously, because it's like very central to, I think, 
our current and uh, living situations in our future. But it makes mm -hmm. me think about like the climate change. I'm very passionate about it too. And um, mm -hmm. it makes me think on a deeper level though, like how do we, besides the technology being deployed to help with climate change, how does this technology influence people's psychology about climate change and their thoughts and feelings? Because while I think it's a larger community of people who will go, okay, this is a very real threat we're facing. There are still people who have the opposite opinion. How do we, how does tech bridge that divide? Mm, brilliant. Brilliant. I, you know, I luckily, there are very few people who have different opinions. Um, so, so, uh, so very few people I know who have different opinions. Right. And uh, it's funny because it always says, you know, surround yourself with people who have different opinions to yours but i really don't know to don't want to know too many of of people who still don't believe in climate change or don't believe how um that could be solved um but i think technology ultimately means access to knowledge for me you know there are ways where we could start educating um you know even the youngest children today know about climate change uh, and they know how to make this little robots um, in the kindergartens, which have nothing to do with climate change. But I just, I'm just talking about how quickly it is adopted by yes. even the youngest um, of us. Which is very, very important because ultimately, you and I, and maybe just people just younger than us, are people who were born and grew up um without technology like imagine this we grew up without access to internet there was no public internet when we were in like the most important years of our lives when it comes to um socializing when it comes to building relationships when it comes to access to knowledge we still had to go to the library and read books whoever is doing that today um but children today they have access to um, to knowledge from the get-go basically when we didn't know we had to go and find it out in a book um, they don't know they just need to google it or chat gpt it i guess that's that's the next verb we're gonna use um so i think that the tech really gives you the access to education that we can you know then start spreading across but is it a good answer to your question? I don't think so. I'm I'm kind of disappointed with it. Um, <laughs> okay. It's just a thought um, experiment in some ways, you know. It's uh, no, I love it. Difficult to it. these are big questions to big things. It's like my daughter's mm. eleven; she knows all about climate change, and, yes. and she understands so much about what's happening in the environment. Whereas, uh, and I'm 44, and uh, I had zero idea what was going on yeah. about the environment when I was growing up in the 80s and the 90s. So right. I think part of it may be that tech is influencing, obviously, people who are adults, but also children so that they grow up with the knowledge that this is something we need to deal with. We may not be changing the minds of people who are our age or older than us. I don't know. But certainly the generations coming up, I think there will be no question about it 100%. there just won't be a question Not about completely. it so it's almost a this generational passing of ideas and as generations come up they take things more seriously of yeah. i think you see this in history with a lot of things like if you think even take about the 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 war ukraine and russia like the majority of people do not have an appetite for war they just don't like they don't want it nice. you know and but in the past wars were very frequent in our history and big, big wars. And I think people just don't have the appetite for it. They don't want the economic, disgusting nature of it. They don't want the horrible PTSD from it, the lives being lost. So I think every generation has either more tolerance or sensitivity for something, or is like, you know, we don't do this anymore. Like, I mean, we use people used to smoke on airplanes. That would never be a thing now, right? We change over our different generations. So I don't, yeah. you know. The answer is the answer. It's whatever you're thinking of. <laughs> you know, like at the moment. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I mean, so do you actually educate your child on, on climate change? Is it something that you actively do or um, is it just because they live in, in this particular moment? Both. I think I think it's a three-pronged approach. So like 
it's not like I talk about it all the time, but it's definitely a thing where like um, my wife and I compost, you know, we talk about the environment in front of each other. We watch shows about it. My daughter watches it. She sees it. She sees what we're mm-hmm. doing. Then she researches stuff herself, which she sees online, people talking, YouTube, whatever. And then at school, they have some courses that actually talk about this. I mean, can you imagine if you grew up and this was a central part of your coursework, the environment? Right? That was not it. It was like earth science, but it wasn't about yeah. climate change. It was earth science. How do the earth is the core of the earth, different you know, environments on the earth, plants, animals, but there wasn't this information about this. And I just think it's just a matter of time. Like the question is, do we have the time? Mm-hmm. You know, how much time do we need before we reach a tipping point? I'm curious because I know that the UN just put out a big report related to this. And I feel like there's always a report, but I also feel like people don't take it that seriously. Like, it's not like if it was like the Kardashians talking about, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, like, but it's like the UN <laughs> said something anyways. <laughs> you know? What are your thoughts? That is about true. That? You know? <laughs> Yeah, no, who cares? Who cares about the UN? Um, no, co- completely agree with you. I I actually have a, a real life example of, you know, how how quickly people jump ships in terms of the new tech and how it enables them to kind of feel good about themselves without really making any impact. Mm. And one of them, and I, I want to hear what you think about metaverse. So okay. Metaverse, honestly, I think it came to Europe a little bit later than the US. I mean, you guys have been on it for, for a while um, with, with companies like Facebook and Meta. Um, but Metaverse is right now number one topic, or maybe not now. Now it's AI, obviously. But yeah. Metaverse last year and the year before were really hot topics. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, I never bought it from the very beginning. I was kind of like, why? Why do we need it? Mm -hmm. I can see some sort of healthcare applications and educational applications, but I don't need a meeting in Metaverse. I mean, this is good. (laughs) If we could do it in person, fine. I'd love that, but not possible. My problem with that is that obviously the some of the luxurious brands like picked it up and they love it and they spend a lot of money, especially in fashion. It's in the next big thing that they can do. And I'm like, no, it isn't. No, it is not the next big thing you can do. It's sustainability that should be on your minds right now. And I'm not yeah. talking about greenwashing and using, you know, brown paper to show that you're super um uh, eco-oriented, but I'm talking about real numbers and um, making sure that you are getting to net zero, that your uh, supply chain is transparent and it's not using forced or underpaid labor. And you know, all those things that they should be thinking about. No, but metaverse, you know, it's the consumer facing tech that we can use and we we pay millions of pounds or dollars for it. Um, But I'm still not buying it. And that's what I think is also human nature. It's it's very evident that we are excited about the next big thing. Um, and, And I think that also goes with, you know, whatever is easier for us. I mean, it's quite easy for like a fashion brand to implement a metaverse. Sure. Um, solution uh, and and utilize it and then sell more garments because of this. It's not quite as easy to to do a complete report on how much carbon you're actually producing. Um, so so I'm I'm just really aware of the fact that that we need we must not allow for other tech or other new things to jump in front of the real goal that we have. And mm. bear in mind, net zero doesn't have to be a goal for everyone. It really doesn't. Um, you said you composting. You said you're educating you know, mm-hmm. your your daughter about that, and you're doing your bit. What I think big corporations want to tell you is that you're not doing your bit. Mm. You know, they want to tell you compost more. You have to recycle. You have sure. to use a bamboo toothbrush. <laughs> I mean, an impact of that is nothing it's not in good, comparison. No. It's nothing, but it makes us feel good, doesn't it? It really, it really does. <laughs> when you recycle your your card box uh, paper, does it does it actually make it down to being recycled? We don't know, but we feel great about this. But I just want to say that whatever we as humans, as a society, as you and I make 
in terms of the choices have a small impact they ha they make us feel good right but it, we should hold big companies uh, accountable for the carbon emissions for the fact that they're greenwashing some of the uh, big oil companies they actually spend more in marketing about their net zero and sustainability causes and projects than they actually spend on those sustainability projects let's not be that let's hold them accountable um so that's it yeah, you know, my I have a couple of takes on this. Uh, Metaverse, mm -hmm. I never bought into it the minute it came out. I was like, mm, this seems like if we're trying to be a ready player one society, uh, that doesn't yeah. seem great to me either because as someone who is a longtime fitness industry executive and veteran, it just feels like it's just another blow to activity and that we are going to cater to people's desire to conserve and be entertained and not actually deal with the real issues that are happening for people. And, and we also know that it's not like these are making people feel better. It's not like people are happier, less lonely because they're living in a metaverse or they're being on Facebook and on. they actually feel worse for that. So I think uh, that I've, I've always like, no, there are pockets of it that I think can be good. The virtual aspect can be really positive and when used properly in different, you know, pick your spots for it. But to kind of like constantly be connected into that, I never bought into that. I'm like, that's crazy. I think that's just avoiding your life, your actual physical life. <laughs> it's like there, I mean, it's, you have to confront your reality versus trying to yeah. live in a different reality. Like, do you have a reality? You must meet it. It just is what it is for that. But it's interesting you mentioned about all the other things, the things that make us feel good. But I do think the big corporations is kind of like, okay, we know like gigantic emissions of carbon come from like commercial air flight, private airplanes, things of that nature. People are not going to stop going on planes. They're not going to turn into Greta Thunberg and go over the ocean and take months or whatever weeks. <laughs> They're not going to do it. People aren't going to do it. So what does that mean? The companies have to create a product like electric airplanes. I know we're farther away from that. We have to create these large changes for because humans are not going to change that behavior. We're not, not going to have like millions of people stop traveling through the air unless something gigantic stops it. That is not humans. <laughs> we're doing that. So it's like we do need to have the corporations actually do something about it. We need to create things that actually make a large change versus just going, hey, let's build a larger seawall because the rise of the ocean is just getting more. We'll just keep getting it bigger. Mm. Let's just make yeah. the wall bigger. That doesn't change anything. <laughs> it's not going to change the actual issue of polar ice cap melting and stuff like that, building a bigger wall, you know, yeah. so. There is real issues. I heard that you had a guy who tried to build a wall and yeah, that didn't you know, work. That didn't change anything either. Let's not talk about <laughs> that. <laughs> right? But it's like, it's like, it's like self-reflection. It's like reflecting on the things that you need to work on yourself. We don't like doing that because then it highlights the things we need to do to change. And right now, humanity is struggling with what do we need to do to actually change and help not only ourselves, but everyone and people struggle with the idea of helping everyone. They struggle with it. Even if you look at retirement, the idea of retirement is very foreign to someone who's in their 20s because they can't, that person who's in their 60s is not a real person to them. That is a foreign person. All the studies and research indicate people don't save for retirement because they don't understand who that person is 50 years from now. They can't even identify who that person will be. They don't even see that that person's a possibility to save for. They treat People treat climate the same way. I can't imagine 100 years from now. I'm not going to be here. Like, so how do you get people to care about something that will be beyond their lifetime and, and unite on that? That's a big central question, I feel like. I love, yeah, I, I so agree. I mean, agree on, on all the points, I think. Um, you're right. People will not will not change their behaviors. We will act the way we have. You know, there are certain people who go completely rogue and um, off grid, 
do you want to do that? Not really. No. I still want to travel. <laughs> I still want to drink my champagne exactly. or Prosecco. That's from the champagne region. That won't be possible anytime, you know, in, in the next couple of decades. The problem is that we will not change our behavior, but what we can do is actually impact the organizations. So I mentioned the governments uh, and government programs. I mean, lucky enough to live in the UK, um, because the government is actually super involved in the net zero transportation, in the future of air mobility, and, and it's actually sponsoring research and the technology development because they know that no investors are going to jump on it. Let's not kid ourselves. If there is no return on investment in sight, which means right. five to 10 years, who cares? Who cares? I'm not going to be the CEO of, of this company anymore. But the government actually needs to step up and take more action. And I think, you know, you mentioned Greta Thunberg. And I, I do believe that she she kind of unlocked something that we all or maybe I kind of secretly wanted, which is the fact that I, too, want to go on strike. I, yeah. too, want to to tell the government that this is the last moment to start acting. And I believe that she, you know, as much as she's mocked and I really hate the fact that, you know, yeah, I don't like uh, that. Even That's not good. Yeah. Older guys are, are really being mean to her and, and undermining the fact that she is unlocking something in what the society needs right now, which is action. Um, and look, I think um, that because she was a younger and a female person, right. she got so much more abuse. Well, she got so much abuse, actually, that was uh, that was actually unhumane, in my opinion. But she persevered. And I think we just need more people like that in our little communities. She's just one person that That's we can right. think about. I'm sure that every single community has another Greta um, unlocking that almost childlike willingness to... to um, rebel you know it's something to say oh you're not good enough for government yeah. you you need to do more so so i really really do love that and then another part is that there's push and pull right there is something that we will do like uh, some people buy sustainable fashion will most people buy sustainable fashion never because sustainable fashion at the moment is at the lowest point that i've ever seen it and i've been tracking it on and off for uh for maybe a decade now it's not really no one's really accountable for anything anymore and there are certain directives like the one in the uk at the moment whereby 30 percent of the packaging has to be recycled hmm. and so every 30 percent of your coke bottle needs to contain 30 sorry every coke bottle needs to contain 30 percent of of recycled plastic why not do more of these you know the the eu just a uh, vote on a directive saying that uh, in 2035, you won't be able to register a um, a car that's not electric. Yeah. Another perfect example of how can you actually cap the greediness of capitalism? And uh, some might not agree with, with this, uh, but I do believe that by a, um, a work, uh, governments working with the society, working with the non-government and NGOs and working with the corporates, we can actually build like a really good circular um, uh, uh, society where the, uh, the, the ecosystem and the environment are in the first place. The decisions are not only made by the lobbyists and corporations, they're actually make, made by those who, who can take every uh, single opinion in mind and then make an, um, an educated uh, decision on that. Yeah, I mean, well said. I mean, there, this is such, this is rich with conversation, this topic, because it's, it's very relevant, but it also is very much a behavioral conversation too with that. Like, how do you get people to change their behavior? But also, how do you get larger entities to change their behavior? Because for them, it's mainly a financial conversation. There's a return on investment conversation. But then on a smaller scale, it's like, how do you create a convenience conversation, right? If you tell 
this state or this country, hey, we have a dire water shortage, right? We're having less snowfall, less water coming with these rivers. People still don't care. Like they just they just keep cons consuming animals. So you almost have to like impede the consumption. You have to, you know, if you say, oh, don't conserve water from two to five, no one listens to that. You have to have some way where like a mechanism goes, there will be no water from two to five. But then if you do that, you're infringing upon my rights for this. It, it gets so complicated, but I, I feel like it's a conversation between the large and the small. What are the larger entities doing to create a, a much bigger impact? And what are you doing at a, a or what can be done at a more local level where accountability happens that doesn't feel like people are going to have mutiny because you infringed upon their right to have water? You know, it's just it's it's frustrating to me, you know, <laughs> on that sense. But you have to like if you want to like recycle your electronics, people are going to say, well, where do I have to go? Is it going to make it hard for me to find a place to recycle my electronics? Whereas maybe that corporation or that store, that business could come to you and take it for, from you, put it out on the curbside or something. Like we need more innovation, not necessarily complicated innovation, but convenience innovation. That's what we've done with like ride sharing. Like people hate taxis, but they love Uber. And like they just took the same concept and made it better. <laughs> like yeah. we need more of that, I feel like. Oh, definitely. I I feel uh, there is a, a big miscommunication around what you can do that's actually impactful yeah. and around what you're doing that makes no change apart from the fact that you pay more. Yes. And, you know, we're talking about the, the bamboo toothbrush. I mean, it's my favorite example that's because it's great. just so random. <laughs> that's so crazy. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there is there are very few ways where people can actually Google, you know, an educated uh, uh, article about what can I do yeah. to save the planet or to stall the climate change. Um, mainly because there is a lot of greenwashing. And fortunately, something's being done whereby, you know, H&M, I think, was fined recently for yeah. greenwashing. And I think finally, you know, finally, someone's being held uh, accountable for not being truthful about their their business practices um, and you know I, I still remember 20 years ago when whatever was something was in like a brown packaging with green writing on it I'm I felt like a hundred percent this is sustainable without even knowing what it was so I think it, it, it really is good to see that something's changing I mean the society's never going to move fast enough um, without the the kind of incentive from the government yeah. or the corporations, um, we are looking at you know uh, the the number of people eating less meat has never been lower. Right. I mean, imagine this, but it's only in the countries where we went through the fact that we all could afford meat, therefore we all got sick of meat, and now we're doing something else. Yeah. But bear in mind, this is small proportion of the world at the moment most of the world right now cannot afford meat so whenever they get their hands on meat obviously they will eat it and i'm not blaming them they're not to blame for yeah. the fact that maybe historically they um they it so happened that they cannot afford the right uh, meal so uh, so the change really should come through the societies that can afford that can yeah. afford to go off meat bear in mind meat alternatives are still if not more expensive than meat and the fact that you can go to a supermarket and buy a steak for three pounds or three dollars is still astonishing to me I mean, how is it possible how is it possible you know to buy your your t-shirt for for 50p or, or <laughs> you know a, a dollar it's not possible. it's not possible that's why i think we need to make that change as a society because the corporations won't won't care. They they don't really care about these things. They just want yeah. to sell, 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 sell. Because that's that's their legacy, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah. It's always about money. It's it always comes down to money, return on investment, and this is um I think one of our really difficult things for us is we everything. The outcome is always about the financial gain. 
And the corporation may feel that it's worth it if there's financial gain. If there's no financial gain, then the corporation's like, well, I don't really have a bleeding heart for this. So if it doesn't make me money, it's the kind of strange truth and world we live in uh, related to that. But I feel like it's just we don't have a great understanding of things that are beyond us. You know, like we just we're so focused on now. We don't care about what happens 100 years from now. Like, it's just Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like I'm a very big minority on this. Like like humans are very absorbed people about the now. But if it doesn't concern you in the future or you don't think because you won't be around, you just don't care. That to me is like, how do you change that? Or is that not changeable? (laughs) <laughs> is it just like the inevitability of like, it's not here in front of me now? You know, it's kind of like if you say, oh, 50 years, you'll be living this lifestyle. They'd be like, well, I, I, I'm here now. I, <laughs> I can't bank on something I can't see in 50 years. That's what people do all the time. And they do it in like every single thing of their living. It's like, well, what have you done for me lately? You know, mm-hmm. the problem is, is that. The mm-hmm. environment, especially, is something you can't play around with on stuff like that. You can do that with a few things in life, but there's a helplessness. You know, you ever been caught in like a big storm? Like one time I was caught in a massive raging thunderstorm and I was like trying to hide and you realize how small you are compared to the power of the environment. And it's like our ego gets in the way like we're, we're not even that big of a deal in the cosmos. Like we're just, we, we, our ego, we're so arrogant. Like, or just get smashed. These small, soft bodies we have. Like, there's nothing, literally nothing. But we think we're so much bigger than the environment and all these things. It's just this hubris. It's just crazy to me, you know? Right. Um, I love when you said that we are so focused on now. Yeah. Uh, and we don't really care about the future. But I... I really think that it's not even now that we're so focused on. We don't have the now anymore. The now that we're thinking about is the Instagrams of the Mm. world. It's the Facebook of the world. It's, you know, the instant gratification that we get from the world. It's not even being mindful. You know, mindfulness and meditation teach you how to really be in the moment. And I love it. But it has nothing to do with the now that I'm living it between emails and, and Instagram <laughs> and, you know, looking at funny memes of dogs. That's the now that kind of, it, 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 it perishes so quickly, yeah, quickly that we don't even capture it. Mm. And good, because, you know, there will always be more memes. There will always be yeah. more Instagram pictures um, of celebrities, but I think that the now that we have right now, when you actually feel your body, you feel the smells is something that we need to grasp more. And I completely agree a hundred years from now, nothing will be there anymore from no one will know us. No one will know what we've done. This podcast will be gone. Everything that we've done in life will be gone. So, so I, I do kind of understand the premise of the fact that why do you live with yeah. an idea of what will be in 100 years? But I'm thinking about the fact that it already, you know, climate change is not something that will happen. It is happening. It is happening. Right yes. now. Exactly. Maybe the storm that you were caught in was because right. of the climate change. You know, the heat that we had last year in, in London. Yes. Greece in London. I mean, no one no one has seen that ever before and i think that finally it's almost like a blessing in disguise yeah because finally people are starting to catch up you know if your holidays are being destroyed because of the rains that will never there or maybe it's right. too hot if it starts to affect people um directly i'm talking holidays obviously very arrogant because there is literally a capital of indonesia sinking right now right and it's because of the design of the city yes but it's also because of the climate change they literally had to move it to borneo and yeah. um, i'm talking about right now and i think yeah. that will make people think a little bit about you know whether to choose meat whether to go shop yeah. at you know h&m 
versus maybe go to a a um, charity store and, and pick something. Oh, from I do that all the time. My wife is like a super person into all this stuff. <laughs> Like she only <laughs> shops at thrift stores only. Love it. She's like, Love it. you can get great stuff at a thrift store. And I was like, eh. and I went with her. I was like, she's right. She's actually right. She's about right. That, right. But people have a bad connotation about stuff like that. Oh, yes. Right. It's just changing oh, yes. the mind. But also, like someone said something to me that I thought was so profound. Actually, to my wife, she said, you know, with climate change, if the world was getting incredibly colder in really warm places, people would probably care more about it. Like if you were in Southern California and all of a sudden it was cold most of the year, people would be pissed. Right. <laughs> but if when in something's kind of hotter, this is romance about heat we have. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's nice. Mm -hmm. It's nicer now. It's not so cold in the summer, in the winter anymore. But if it was like went from being, uh, you know, 65 degrees Fahrenheit, really nice. And all of a sudden the place you live was like 30 degrees Fahrenheit regularly. A lot of people would move. They'd be like, I, I don't want to deal with this. I, I do not. People don't want to be cold, but they're OK no, with being somewhat hot, somewhat hot. You know, there's, it can yeah. be. I remember I lived in Europe growing up in Germany, and I remember the summers were mm. you know, like it was nice. It was very nice in the summer, very mild. It was nice. And yeah. I have friends in Germany and they're like, it's hot in the summer in Germany. It's hot. I was yeah. like, well, I don't remember that. I don't. I, yeah. and that's happening everywhere, though. But we have a tolerance for some reason for heat. That's true. A little bit. But yeah. don't, people don't have tolerance for cold, man. They're like, it's kind of cold. No, it's too cold. It's <laughs> too cold. Year. <laughs> I, I don't want to be cold. I, it's warm. OK, it's, it's 75. It's nice. You know, it's like <laughs> cold. Whatever oh, no, that no. means. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 75 <laughs> degrees. Perfect. Whatever. You know, I don't know the Celsius thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> but like, you know, I know. It's a, I guess it's warm. I know it's, it's nice. a dumb American thing. I know. It's like, why don't you guys get with the program with like the, you know, the <laughs> metric system and stuff? I'm like, it's America. I know. Uh, You'll catch up. You'll catch up. <laughs> we'll catch up at some point. Yeah. Uh, At some point, you get there. Whatever it was is nice, a very beautiful, nice, warm summer night. People love that. You know, if your place is cold and it went to being a very beautiful, warm summer night, you're like, this is not so bad. But if it went the mm. opposite direction, you're not happy at all. Right. People would care yeah. more. So I think yeah. we're being lulled into that, too, on some level. A little bit. A little yeah, bit. I mean, Just a little bit, you know. Just a little bit. But last year, I mean, I was complaining about the heat, but I mean, people loved it, right? We are all outside. No one did any work in the summer. We are all <laughs> just in parks and pubs, just sitting outside and, you know, enjoying ourselves. But I mean, this is, it's not even funny. Every time you would say, oh, it's so nice and sunny, you kind of stop yourself being like, yeah. oh God, I shouldn't really say that. This is terrible. You right. know, I shouldn't enjoy something that's so destructive. And probably is, you know, killing crops and right. and people even in, in certain situations. Yes. Um, and confusing but I, I wildlife, think... confusing wildlife and plants 100%. and, you know, the, the, the whole ebb and flow of the seasons and harvesting and crops all getting changed. People are not plugged into that. I'm telling you, they're not. No, no. But you got to educate and you, you have to talk about it you know the more you talk to other people about mm. what you've learned what you've read bill gates released a book last year and you might agree with bill you might not yeah. agree with bill yeah. but his book opened my eyes in many different ways in using the tag for the better that i didn't know before and you know i read his book i shared this with a couple of my friends colleagues and family you know they might read it they might share it again I think this is a really powerful thing about society is that we like to spread the word. We yes. like to tell stories and we like to educate ourselves. And I think, you know, going back to your daughter, I really love the fact that, you know, she knows she, she she's knows. probably smashing it. She knows more than we do. She knows all the stats and she will go in the world and she'll start educating other people. We need those Greta's. We need people like your daughter and we need people who can just talk and kind of bring different solutions to the world. Um, there are lots of people who've never tried fake meat, you know, the fake yeah. sausages or, or, or impossible. It's amazing. And I, I think yeah, it's, it's just about you trying it. And then you're like, 
I don't I don't need meat anymore. Maybe once a week, that's fine sure. with me, you know? Yeah. 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 I tell you what, this is a this is an awesome conversation because it's just so relevant for our times in the future. And I know it's late for you. Again, late <laughs> night, Agatha. Thank you for being on late night. And if I am in London, we are gonna go raving. Are you gonna go? Yes, please. Yes, you're in absolutely, totally in. and I'll take you to a pub, and uh, you down. know we're just I'm gonna hang down. out in the heat. In the heat, <laughs> <laughs> it could be hot in the, in London now. <laughs> I'm like, thank you so much for your time. Please let all the lovely people know how they could learn more about you. Um, absolutely. I, I'm always um super open to to chatting with anyone if you have a business idea that you like to get off the ground if you're an underrepresented founder looking for uh, you know any advice in in career or any advice i can't give live advice i'm not certified yet but you know um i'm, I'm i'd love to talk to you um you can find me on linkedin agatha maria bendik um and that's pretty much it i also have an email that's agatha m bendik at gmail.com you can find pink brew studio maybe that's easier to actually find me at uh, agatha at pinkbrew.studio um and that's my organization that specifically helps underrepresented founders in the tech space fantastic thank you so much agatha and uh, have a good rest of your evening Thank you so much.